This Rabbi Yaakov Wolby podcast is sponsored by Fabuloso Household Care Rabbi Cleaner. Pastor, Fill I your home with joy. No ads on my podcast. This podcast is brought to you by Tyson's Face Tats. No Have ads. you ever wanted to look like. No sponsorships. Average Rabbi, please. Bill and Anthony's Daily Multivax. Order your six month supply Rabbi with Pastor, promo code TORCH for 10% average off. Average Rabbi. No ads. No sponsorships. No promo codes. But this is how we make money. This is not how we make money. This is not how we make money. I, I will not subject. My podcast listeners, the listeners that I love, the listeners that want to come hear Torah and hear words of wisdom and learn about their heritage and learn about Jewish history and learn about Jewish values and connect themselves with the Almighty and connect themselves with His Torah and deepen their bond with their soul. I'm not going to have readouts. Rabbi Basto, my dear colleague, I'm not going to do it. Rabbi, well, we have bills to pay. Uh, so what's the other option? Is there anything else we could do? We need help. Oh, okay. Well, maybe we, maybe we do something else. You see, most podcasts, they have to pay their bills and they have ads and they have readouts and they have promo codes and they have Dollar Shave Club and Geico and mattresses. I don't want to sell you mattresses. I want to give you what you come for. I want to give you Torah. I want to give you wisdom from the Almighty. I want to give you a connection with our glorious religion and glorious heritage. But we need to pay our bills. So what we do is that we don't do any ads. No ads. No, no matter how much the average rabbi, my colleague, Rabbi Busto, insists on doing the ads, insists on doing these promo codes, none of that. We do an annual fundraiser, and that's happening right now. And the website for that is givetorch.org. Give, the word give, to give. Give your heart. Give your soul. Give a little boost, a little bit of love to Torch. GiveTorch.org. It's happening right now. Every donation is doubled. This is our only annual fundraiser. We do this once a year. Until next year, you're not going to hear about this. It's happening now. If, you, if you're hearing this right now, you should know that it's still active. Every donation is doubled. And yes, Robert Busco, he's insistent. He's insistent. Are you insistent? Well, if there's a better a little solution. Bit. I do like the multivax. <laughs> yeah, okay. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll, maybe we'll make a little exception for that. But no ads. That, that's the plan. We've done now podcasts since 2012, 12 years, and we're committed to this. We're committed to connecting Jews and Judaism locally in Houston and globally throughout our podcast and the many other digital offerings that we have here at Torch. We do one fundraiser a year and we want your support. Visit givetorch.org. Right now, press pause on the podcast. Press pause. Stop the podcast. GiveTorch.org. Make a donation. And then, you know, for the rest of the year, you are partnering with us. We're not going to bombard you with ads. We're not going to bombard you with fundraising emails every day, every week, every month. Once a year, we try to get everyone to give, everyone to contribute. If you appreciate our work, if you enjoy our work, if you want to support our work, if you want to support the great rabbis here at the Torch Center, Rabbi Busto, the average rabbi, and everyone else that's over here, and all the incredible work that we do here from the Torch Center Houston, Texas, visit givetorch.org right now and make a donation. Show us some love. We're not gonna, we're not gonna drive you crazy. Make the donation. Of course, my email address is rabbiwolbajima.com and that website again, givetorch.org. This is going to be part two of our series on the two-state solution, which you will discover it's not really a solution. It's just a problem. It's going to exacerbate the problem. You'll hear that in just a bit. But before we start, I want to make a request from you. I want to ask you for a favor. Visit givetorch.org. We're hosting our annual fundraiser here from the Torch Center in Houston, Texas. If you enjoy our work, if you enjoy our podcasts, if you gain something from all the work that we do over here, if you benefit, if you learn, if you're educated and entertained from what we do here at the Torch Center, give us some support. Chip in. Help us continue the great work of Torch. Help us ignite the Torch again strongly in 2024. We do one fundraiser a year. That's it. Once a year, we ask you for your support. So please, if you if you can... Hit pause on your podcast player and visit givetorch.org. I'm going to put the link in the description so you just scroll down. You'll see the link. Give it a click. Every donation is doubled. This is a matching campaign. 
once a year. We ask for your support. The website is givetorch.org. And by doing that, you are supporting the Jewish History Podcast and all the other amazing podcasts that come out of the Torch Center in Houston, Texas. Again, the website is givetorch.org. This is our matching campaign for 2024. We do it once a year. That's it. Help us. Help us reach our goal. Help us continue doing our very important work. GiveTorch.org. Thank you so much for your support. And please enjoy the podcast. Of course, my email address is RabbiWolby at gmail.com. This Jewish History Podcast is dedicated by my dear friend, Shali Lichtman, with the express request that we continue the Jewish History Podcast. And I will tell you that we never actually retired the Jewish History Podcast. We just took a long hiatus. But now, with the help of the Almighty, we did two in a single week, part one and part two of the two-state solution. And granted, we did it in honor of the Torch fundraiser happening right now at givetorch.org. But I guess this shows, this is evidence that we still we still could do it. But I want to hear more about your desire for more Jewish history podcasts. And the best way to do that is to visit givetorch.org. You'll find the link in the description. And make a donation on the Jewish History Podcast page and show us how much you appreciate it and support the great work of Torch. And hopefully we will continue doing many Jewish History Podcasts for years to come. Thank you so much for your support. Thank you for visiting givetorch.org and supporting the Jewish History Podcast and supporting the great work of our organization, Torch. And of course, my email address is rabbiwalby at gmail.com. It has been a long-standing dream of every American administration over the past 30 years to finally solve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. This problem has gone on for so long. And it doesn't seem to be so intractable. There must be some way to finally resolve it once and for all. And just imagine, imagine the legacy accomplishment, the fawning press, the White House Rose Garden signing ceremony. Any president that pulls this off will surely be awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. This is a problem that if you were to solve it, it would be an accomplishment of a lifetime. Everyone wants to solve it. Everyone wants a permanent solution to this problem. And everyone seems to promote a plan with very similar contours. Both sides will have to give up a little bit. Territorial concessions on both sides. Both sides need security. We have to have some sort of security guarantee for both sides. Of course, lots of American money to placate both sides. Jerusalem, they want Jerusalem, they want Jerusalem, give it to both of them. If everyone gives up a little bit, if everyone compromises, if there's mutual recognition, finally these two people who have been at each other's necks for so long, they can finally move past their differences and live in peace and harmony and prosperity. Two states, for two people, the famed two-state solution. Now, last time we talked about why it's likely never to happen, or at least not in the foreseeable future. We talked about the danger and the peril of trying to force the issue. Today, I want to survey some of the various proposals that have been presented over the course of the decades, all of them doomed to failure, and then maybe to propose or to suggest or to outline some of the other approaches to this problem that maybe can still work. This is not a new problem. Already a hundred years ago, the international community understood that the coterminous existence of these dueling peoples with dueling religions and cultures and societies and ideologies, and they're both placed at the most sacred and sensitive place in the world. This is just a recipe for conflict. And they sought to solve the problem by giving each side something. And it's important to remember, and we spoke about this in the past, there already is a 
two-state solution. When the British mandate for Palestine was granted, the plan was for them to oversee Palestine, which then covered both sides of the Jordan, until it could be handed over to the Jews for a Jewish state in fulfillment of their commitment in the Balfour Declaration. But very soon afterwards, 1922, the British carved out all the land on the east of the Jordan for the the emirate that became the Hashemite kingdom of Transjordan, which became Jordan, and that was designated for an exclusively Arab state where no Jews were permitted to live. 80% of the land of the British mandate was already allocated for the Arabs. The only possibility for a Jewish homeland would be on what remained on the west side of the Jordan. That was in 1922. In 1948, well, the state of Israel was founded. So accordingly, we have two states for two people. On the east side, we have an Arab state, Jordan. On the west side, we have Israel, a Jewish state, the two-state solution. But that's not what we're talking about. When we speak about the two-state solution, we're talking about two states on the lands west of the Jordan. And for a century, there have been various proposals to split that land into two states, one for the Arabs and one for the Jews. It's never happened that the Arabs accepted the existence of a Jewish state. When the world first proposed the existence of a Jewish state, the Arabs were never interested. When the Paris peace conference happened at the end of World War I, the Arabs of Palestine boycotted it. In the San Remo conferences of 1920, the Arabs rejected it. When the League of Nations affirmed the decisions to begin the process of establishing a Jewish homeland in Palestine, it was again rejected. The first comprehensive two-state solution was proposed in 1937. This is the famed Peel Commission, or the Royal Commission for Palestine. In the mid-1930s, there was an explosion of violence in Palestine. The Mufti of Jerusalem, Haj Amin al-Husseini, he instigated a bloody set of, of riots and revolts. It began with a general strike of Arab workers. For six months, there was a strike from April to October 1936. And that was coupled with a boycott on Jewish products. The Jewish Yeshuv, the Jewish settlement of the land, was flourishing. And the economy was booming, relatively speaking. And the Arabs were envious and they wanted to do whatever they can to stop the Jewish flourishing in the land, and they launched this revolt. And it started with economics, but it very quickly escalated into terror attacks against the Jews and against the British. Over the next three years, more than 500 Jews were killed in terrorist attacks by Arabs. Now, the Zionists, they had various underground groups, paramilitary groups, that fought back with retaliatory violence, most notably the Haganah and the Irgun. I will I will note that at the time, the British introduced a policy to try to deter Arab terrorism, and the policy stated that any Arab terrorist that commits an act of terrorism their house will be demolished. And that policy, by the way, is currently maintained by Israel. So amid all this tension and the violence and the revolt and the rebellion, the British, they established a commission, the Peel Commission, to try to figure out what's happening, why is all this violence happening, and what perhaps would a long-term solution look like. And at the head of the commission was Lord Robert Peel, And for a few months in London, he heard a lot of testimony about Palestine, about the history, and about the current state. Quite memorably, 
Uh, David Ben-Gurion was one of the big Zionist leaders at the time. Of course, he was the first prime minister of Israel. He held up a Bible and said, this is our deed to the land. And there is some irony in that, because although he was quite well versed in the Tanakh, in the Jewish Bible, he himself was not a believer. After a few months, the Peel Commission hears all the testimony and they release their report. And the first thing they say, unequivocally, is that the violence is the result of the Arabs. They called it, quote, an open rebellion of the Palestinian Arabs, assisted by fellow Arabs from, from other countries against mandatory rule. Now you will notice the term Palestine or Palestinian, the British applied both to the Jews and the Arabs. Palestine was the land and all those who lived in it were Palestinians. Of course, today, the term Palestinian is applied exclusively to the Arabs. Now, the Peel Commission also found, and this is something we've seen again and again, that the Arabs weren't really interested in Palestine as a standalone state. They regarded it as perhaps a province of Syria. But nevertheless, with regards to the question of who had rights to the land historically, the Peel Commission found that both the Jews and the Arabs, they had claims to the land that were compelling. So what to do? You try to make peace and maybe assimilate these two people into one nation, they already determined that's not going to happen. That's an impossibility. And therefore, they came up with a plan, the famous partition plan, Carve up the lands on the west side of the Jordan. Give one parcel of land to the Jews. They'll have their state. They'll fulfill their Zionist dreams. They'll have the right of self-determination. And give a second state to the Arabs west of the Jordan. This is a quote. While neither can justly rule all Palestine, why not, if it's practicable, each race should not rule part of it? This would solve, again, another quote, irrepressible conflict between two national communities within the narrow bounds of one small country. Partition seems to offer at least a chance of ultimate peace. We can see none in any other plan. In 1937, the Royal Commission, headed by Lord Peel, said this is this is the only solution. Two states for two people. That's the only way to solve the problem. That was said again 87 years ago. And we wonder, has anything changed? People today are still saying the same thing. The only solution is a two-state solution. Now, the Commission also had a map of what the what the breakdown, what the partition will look like. And the division of the land was very unfavorable to the Jews. Of the original British mandate, the land proposed to go to the Jews under the Peel Commission's recommendations, that would comprise only 4% of the original mandate. And it would, and it would be broken up into two non-contiguous sections. It would effectively be a 10-mile-wide strip from Tel Aviv going north to Haifa, and then it would widen a bit north of Haifa until the border with Lebanon. That would be one section, and then there would be another smaller section south of that, a small piece of land south of Jaffa all the way to Gaza. And then bisecting the two non-contiguous parts of the proposed Jewish state was a British-controlled area that would include Jerusalem, even though Jerusalem had a Jewish majority already since the 1890s, that would be governed by the British. They'd maintain that because it's just too sensitive. Now, by contrast, the Arab portion of this, of this partition plan, it was contiguous and it was massive by comparison. It was four times larger. Of course, that's not including the Kingdom of Jordan on the other side of the Jordan River. It included the entire Negev and the West Bank and 
of course, the Gaza Strip. This plan was proposed. This plan was accepted by the British government and parliament. We have a deal, right? Do we have a deal? So, of course, neither side was thrilled with this proposal. But the Jews accepted it nonetheless. Chaim Weizmann, the Zionist leader, he would go on to be the first president of Israel. He remarked that I'd be willing to accept a state even if it is the size of a tablecloth. Doesn't matter. If they grant us a state, we're taking it. There were, a lot of people were very disgruntled by the, the size and the shape and the layout. But ultimately, the Zionists accepted it. By contrast, the Arabs categorically opposed the Peel Commission recommendations. They demanded that all of Palestine be placed under Arab control. And what about the Jews? They should be transferred. The Arabs said, this country, it just, it cannot assimilate the Jews that are now here, that are now in the, in the country. And the British tried to bring the parties together to negotiate, and the Arabs refused to sit in the same room as the Jews. So we have a, a proposal, the first formal two-state solution. 1937, the Peel Commission, the Jews accepted it, the Arabs rejected it. There was a follow-up the year later, though, the Woodhead Partition p- Proposal. It was slightly modified, and again, it was rejected by the Arabs and accepted by the Jews. So the partition plan, it's not going to work. It was shelved and renewed Arab violence once again bloodied the Holy Land. And you wonder what would have happened had this partition plan been accepted. For sure, it would have been quite a pathetic state. For sure. But only two years later, World War II began. And six million Jews were murdered by the Nazi beast in the inferno of Europe. Nobody wanted them. They were stuck. And you wonder how might things have been different if a Jewish state existed, small, non-contiguous, fraught as it may have been. After the war, the newly founded United Nations resurrected the partition plan. And they proposed it again. After the war, there was again an increase in tension and violence in Palestine, and the British were simply fed up with managing the mandate of Palestine. It had become a drag on the empire due to the fighting between the Jews and the Arabs. British, The British had to garrison 100,000 soldiers to try to maintain calm over the 1.8 million inhabitants of Palestine. There were 1.2 million Arabs and 600,000 Jews. And they needed 100,000 soldiers to keep the peace, or to try to, futilely. That was the same number of soldiers that they needed to watch over India, which was still part of the British Empire. India at the time had a population of 350 million people. They don't want to deal with it. They've managed it for 20-something years, and they're done. And they're not willing to give the Jews a state without the Arabs accepting it. And they come to the United Nations in February of 1947. It's your problem, not ours. And again, the UN did some studies, and they issued a report And again, they found that both sides have legitimate claims, but their positions are irreconcilable. And the only way to solve the problem is a two-state solution, a partition plan, which they did. The borders of this map were, again, very unfavorable to the Jews, but it was slightly more generous than the Peel Commission from 11 years earlier. In addition to the parts along the coast, the Jews were granted an enclave in Jerusalem and the Negev Desert, some land 
that they had previously had was taken away. Some a chunk in the north was given, was allocated to the Arabs. And yes, the land was still disjointed and unconnected. Of course, Jerusalem would be isolated from the rest of the state. But again, we have a two-state solution. And once again, the Jews accepted it and the Arabs rejected it. The Secretary General of the Arab League said as follows, quote, The Arab world is not in a compromising mood. Nations never concede. They fight. You won't get anything by peaceful means or compromise. You can perhaps get something, but only by force of your arms. It may be that we shall lose Palestine, but it's too late to talk of peaceful solutions. The Arabs are not interested, but notwithstanding the Arab rejection, on the 29th of November, 1947, by a vote of 33 yes, 13 no, with 11 abstentions, the United Nations approved the partition plan, two states for two people. This day is still celebrated in Israel. Chavtet bin November, 29th of November. This is the day when the UN, when the body that, the, the, that comprised world governments, they called for a Jewish state in Palestine. Near the yeshiva that I merited studying in, in Israel, there's a street. And the street's called Chavtet 29 in November. Okay, we have a plan. Jews are granted a state. But how exactly with, will this plan be implemented? The British said it's not our problem. On May 15th, 1948, we are out of here. And again, this official recognition by world body once again prompted the Arabs to launch deadly riots and that followed by deadly reprisal attacks from Jewish paramilitary groups. And preparing for the war surely to come, volunteers from Arab countries began flocking to the land to fight the Jews. The de facto war of independence had begun. Over the next couple of months, from when the UN passed the resolution granting Israel a state, until the British actually left, there was an immense explosion of violence. More than a thousand Jews were killed by Arab terrorists. And the, the, the center, the epicenter of this conflict was Jerusalem because the main hub of Jewish Palestine, Jewish Israel was along the coasts, but they had that enclave in Jerusalem. But that enclave was effectively besieged on all sides by Arabs. And they had no food, no supplies, no medicine, no military provisions. And Jewish, the, the Jewish forces outside of Jerusalem would have to try to break through the siege. And the only road to Jerusalem, it passed through mountains where the vehicles down below were exposed to gunmen who took unopposed pot shots from the mountaintops. So all the supplies to besieged Jerusalem had to traverse through this dangerous road. And every time they went, they knew they were in for a fight. And that was a deadly trip, often. And the most deadly of these attacks was the Hadassah Medical Convoy Massacre. This is in April of 1948. A convoy which had some Haganah forces protecting it, they were bringing medical and military supplies and personnel to the Hadassah Hospital on Mount Scopus in Jerusalem, and they were ambushed, and there was a seven-hour firefight that resulted in the deaths of 78 Jewish doctors and nurses and students and patients and faculty members and Haganah fighters including 23 women, they were killed. And some of them, their bodies were burned beyond recognition 
They cannot be identified, and they were buried in a mass grave in the Sanhedria Cemetery in Jerusalem. This treacherous road situation effectively strangled Jewish Jerusalem. And the only way they were able to break the siege was when they made a a makeshift road that bypassed the danger zone. It's called the Burma Road. And it allowed critical supplies to be provisioned to Jerusalem. If you drive on the Jerusalem Tel Aviv Highway today, you could see along alongside the highway, they still have many of the hulls of the destroyed vehicles on the side of the road. The, the convoy skeletons, as they call them, Israel kept them there as a monument of the ferocious battles and heroic sacrifices that occurred on this road at the state's inception. At 4 p.m. on May 14th, 1948, the British lowered their flag and immediately the new state of Israel was declared. I actually met someone here in Houston a few weeks ago. He's a neighbor's father and he was wearing a yarmulke that had his name stenciled into it and it said the name Yisrael Meir, which it's my son's name, one of my son's names. And it's, of course, the name of the Chavetz Chaim. So I said, oh, you must be named after the Chavetz Chaim. He says, no, no, I was born May 14th, 1948. And my parents had all these other names planned. But because this was the day that coincided with the founding of the state, they said, we have to add the name Yisrael. Israel. Because he was born on that day. Israel declares independence. And immediately, five Arab states declare war. Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Egypt, Jordan, they begin their attack. The War of Independence officially begins. And their plans were genocidal. Here's a quote from the Secretary General of the Arab League, one Azam Pasha, quote, This will be a war of extermination and a momentous massacre, which will be spoken of like the Mongolian massacres and the Crusades. He seems quite quite charming. Israel has no armored corps, no tanks, no artillery, no no air force, no military academy. Those paramilitary groups were cobbled together into the IDF, the Israeli Defense Force, They really had nothing. They had 600,000 citizens. Many of them were Holocaust survivors. And they're facing off against 45 million Arabs. But by golly, the Jews won. The victory was bittersweet. The losses were staggering. Over the course of the 13-month war, the War of Independence, 6,000 Jews, 6,000 Israelis, a full 1% of the population, perished. But the war ended. And there was an armistice agreement that was signed. Jordan, Transjordan, controlled the West Bank, which includes East, East Jerusalem, the Old City, the Western Wall, Temple Mount. In every map that has the political, geopolitical map of Israel, the borders of the armistice agreement that ended the War of Independence will always have a green line. It's known as their green line. In the Armistice Agreement, Jordan pledged to allow Jews to access the Western Wall and the Jewish cemetery in the Mountain of Olives. Do you think they kept their promises? No, they did not. Jews would be barred from these sites until 1967, until the Six-Day War, when Israel won a stunning victory. They captured the West Bank. They captured East Jerusalem. They captured the old city of Jerusalem from the Jordanians. And Jews were finally allowed back to the Western Wall. Of course, the conquests went beyond Jordan. In the north, Israel captured the Golan Heights from the Syrians. In the south, Egypt. They conquered all the lands from Israel all the way to the Suez Canal. The Sinai Desert, the Sinai Peninsula is now in Israeli hands. The Gaza Strip which was controlled by Egypt, is again in Israeli hands. What happens now? It's 1967. The state is 19 years old. Israel has no peace with any Arab or Muslim. 
countries, and they have just tripled the size of the state in six days. They fought and defeated Egypt, Syria, and Jordan. Right away, Israel made a decision. We don't want to keep all these lands permanently. We want to give them back in exchange for peace. First things first, right after the conquest of Jerusalem, Moshe Dayan, the defense minister, he handed control of Temple Mount back to the Muslim religious authority, the Waqf. But many more lands Israel was interested in exchanging land for peace. And this was voiced by the international community in the United Nations Security Council Resolution 242, the famous the famous uh, resolution which Israel accepted, and this is the plan going forward, we will exchange land for peace. And yes, they did slowly begin to settle the lands that they conquered. They built some settlements in Sinai, but very few, the largest being Yamit, famously. But there were not more than a few thousand Jewish settlers in the Sinai because it was really being held for a peace agreement with with Egypt, which happened in the late 1970s with the Camp David Accords. Israel returned every inch of the Sinai, and they got a peace deal with Anwar Sadat and the Egyptians. Now, Gaza, Egyptians weren't interested in it. That remained under Israeli rule. In the north, Syria was completely unreceptive to peace. They could have gotten back the Golan Heights if they wanted a deal, but they were and remain uninterested. In 1981, Israel annexed the Golan. That decision was affirmed by the United States in 2019. That ship, returning the Golan for peace with Syria, it seems like it has sailed though it seems that Israel is still receptive to a peace for the Golan deal with Syria, even after the annexation. I remember the 1990s in Israel, there was a big movement. Ha'am im ha'golan. The nation is, is with the Golan Heights. We don't want to forfeit it. Even though that would perhaps give you a peace accords with Syria, the, the, the people didn't want it. Let's keep it. But even today, the Golan Heights are very much underdeveloped and under-inhabited, you do get a sense that it's possible that this will still be dangled in some sort of agreement sometime in the future. They, After President Trump, he agreed or he codified the Israeli annexation of the, of the Golan, the Israeli government, they went to some hilltop in the Golan, and there was a big sign there. We're renaming this settlement, this city. It's called Ramat Trump, Trump Heights. This is going to be a new city named after Trump. I was there. There's literally nothing there besides for a very large sign. What about the lands conquered from Jordan? What about all those lands in the aforementioned green line, the lands on the west bank of the Jordan? What about, for that matter, the Gaza Strip? that was conquered from Egypt. Those two lands would be the basis of all future discussions of a two-state solution. And it's important to note, we have already said that Palestinian nationalism is a very new thing. It was really more about Arab control of the land. And which Arabs doesn't really matter. After the Six-Day War, this changed. The conflict, it morphed from an Israeli-Arab conflict to an Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Again, it's important to stress, there never was a Palestinian state. Gaza was previously part of Egypt. The West Bank was previously part of Jordan. And the term Palestine, or Palestinian, didn't mean Arab. The British again called both Jews and Arabs Palestinians, but it's fine. They can have it. (laughs) They can have it. After the war, Palestinian nationalism began to take hold. And the organization that carried the most sway was the PLO, Palestinian 
liberation organization. And what was their focus? What was their mission? It was, quite simply, the elimination of Israel and the slaughter of all its inhabitants. Its founder, he predicted that in the war that will eventually happen with the Palestinians and the and the Jews and the Israelis, no Jews would survive. This organization, deemed by America to be a terrorist organization, it was taken over by the arch-terrorist Yasser Arafat in 1969. And he spearheaded some of the worst terror attacks on the Jews, including, of course, the Munich Massacre. 11 Israeli athletes at the 1972 Olympic Games, they were slaughtered. And they loved the drama of, of hijackings, the whole Black September hijackings and the Entebbe hijackings and the hijacking of the Italian cruise ship, the Achille Loro, when they shot and killed and threw overboard a wheelchair-bound American Jew named Leon Klinghoffer. And in Israel, there were all sorts of horrific attacks perpetrated by the PLO. In 1975, they attacked the Savoy Hotel, took hostages, killed a whole bunch of them in a standoff. 1974, there was the Ma'alot Massacre, a faction within the PLO, which is the DFLP, the Democratic Front for the Liberation of Palestine. They took over a school in the town of Ma'alot in northern Israel, and 21 Israeli students were killed. The Coastal Road Massacre of 1978, a group of PLO terrorists hijacked a bus on the Tel Aviv Haifa Highway, and 38 Israeli civilians were killed, including 13 children. This is a very partial list. If we, if we were to have a, an entire list of all the terrorist attacks, of the PLO, it might take us several several podcasts to delineate them all. There were literally thousands of innocent people who were killed by this brutal terrorist organization, the PLO, and its maniacal head, Yasser Arafat. But perversely, these unconscionable acts of unspeakable brutality, it actually was successful at bringing the grievances of the Palestinians to the attention of the world. In 1974, this is before the PLO was reformed, before they were trying to get peace, when they were just a plain old terrorist organization. The United Nations invited them, invited the PLO to have special, quote, observer status. You're you're a stateless group, you can't vote. But you could engage in debates and you have your flag at the UN. You're, you're an observer. Other peoples that don't have a state, like the Kurds, the Tibetans, the Basques in Spain and France, they're all ignored. They have much better, more just claims, but they are ignored. Terrorism works. It can actually persuade public opinion in the favor of the perpetrator. And at a time when Israel was saying, we want land for peace, we affirm the United Nations Resolution 242. The PLO rejected it. And they rejected the right to exist of a UN member state Israel. And they rejected the partition plan. And they wanted the transfer of all Jews out of Palestine and instead to establish one state, the state of Palestine. And they engaged in wanton slaughter of innocents. They were granted special observer status at the UN. This terrorist organization was centered in Jordan. But they did so much terrorism in Jordan against the Jordanians, they were banished from Jordan. They relocated to southern Lebanon. And that prompted the first Lebanon war. After a PLO assassination attempt against the Israeli ambassador to the United Kingdom, Israel invaded Lebanon to root out the Palestinians, the PLO. And this is the first Lebanon war. The operation Shalom HaGalil, Peace for the Galilee, Israel entered Lebanon and the occupied southern Lebanon. And again, the PLO had to flee, this time to Tunis. And operating far, far away, 
the PLO launched the first intifada, which is a period of violent riots, attacks, brutal attacks, suicide bombings from a distance. They kept their terror activities in Israel ongoing. But the group changed. They rebranded themselves. They rehabilitated their image. The PLO says, 1988, we're done with terrorism. We're renouncing terrorism. And we're not the PLO anymore. We're, we're rebranded as the Palestinian Authority, the PA. And we're going to formally recognize Israel. And we want to become a partner for peace. And we want to do a two-state solution. That's the change of heart of Arafat and the PLO in 1988. Or so he claimed. Did he actually mean it? Afterwards, after he publicly pledged to accept Israel, to endorse a two-state solution, this is a quote of what he said internally to other Arab leaders in Stockholm. We of the PLO, this is a quote, will now concentrate all of our efforts on splitting Israel psychologically into two camps. Within five years, we will have six to seven million Arabs living on the West Bank and in Jerusalem. All Palestinian Arabs will be welcomed by us. If the Jews import all kinds of Ethiopians, Russians, Uzbeks, and Ukrainians as Jews, we can import all sorts of Arabs with us. And this is, a, this is the important quote. The PLO plans to eliminate the state of Israel and establish a purely Palestinian state. We will make life unbearable to the Jews by psychological warfare and population explosion. Jews won't want to live among us Arabs. So publicly to Western foreign sources, Arafat claims, oh, I want peace. I'm done with terrorism. I'm the PA, not the PLO anymore. I'll recognize Israel. Let's make a deal. But truthfully, he's still seeking the elimination of Israel. Regardless, Arafat's maneuver worked. The U.S. removes the PA from the list of terror organizations. They recognize Israel. Israel, Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin, they in turn recognize them. These are the legitimate representatives of the Palestinian peoples. And this is the background for the modern movement of a two-state solution. This began with the Oslo Accords of 1993. At the time, the Prime Minister was Yitzhak Rabin, and his political nemesis was the foreign minister, that's Shimon Peres, and he negotiated with the Palestinians in Oslo, in Norway, to create a new paradigm for the region and the possibility, the framework, that will lead to a two-state solution. And the Accords, the Oslo Accords, it created a framework for Palestinian self-governance in certain parts of the West Bank, and to slowly, through a, a, a staggered series of territorial withdraw withdrawals, to transition these lands to more and more governing uh, rule of the Palestinians until we could have final status negotiations at a, f a future point, five years in the future. And they divided the West Bank into three sections. Area A, that was the area that was exclusively Arab. The Palestinians, the PA, the rebranded PLO, they'll, they'll have civilian and security control. Area B, it's going to be a hybrid. It's going to be Palestinian civilian control, but Israeli security control. And then Area C, that covers all the Israeli settlement blocks. And there will be Israeli civilian and security control. This was in the 1990s, and it's still, this framework is still in effect today. You could drive, you drive out of Jerusalem, and within a minute, you're in the, in the West Bank, and it's kind of very fluid. When you're in Area C, it's basically Israel. There's a lot of Arabs around, but it's basically Israel. But if you slip into Area B, it's half and half. There is some Israeli security presence, but it's like you're walking into a different country. And if you, if you use Google Maps, they, they don't care. There isn't a, there isn't a setting, you know, they have the avoid tolls, avoid highways. There isn't like an avoid lynches setting that you could put on your phone. So when I was there a couple of years ago, 
I was like, I need to get someplace. I had a bunch of kids, my children, a few of their cousins in the car. And before I know it, I'm driving through Area B. And then you see where Area B turns into Area A. And there's these big red signs. Israeli citizens, don't make a right turn. If you do, we cannot protect you. You're outside of Israeli security protection. Because in those areas, not only is there Palestinian civilian rule, there's also Palestinian security rule. You can't go in there. A lot of Israelis would go there because they would go fix their cars because the Arabs are so much cheaper. You want to get some car work. You have Israeli do it, it'd be very expensive. You go into these areas and it's much, much cheaper. But there's a decent chance to be shot, which happened many, 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 many times. People trying to save some money on a mechanic and end up dead. But we were driving through Area B, and I was kind of terrified. I have all these kids in the car. I'm responsible for them. And there's only Arabs everywhere. That's it. And I'm like, I'm davening, I'm praying, Tashem, Hashem, let, let us get through this. And my son Akiva, he's like, what are you worried about? If Hashem wants us to die, we'll die. That's the right thing. If he wants us to die, that was not quite uh, comforting. It didn't placate my fears. But today, let's. It, it, this situation is the reality on the ground. And that's a product of the Oslo Accords. And there was a few rounds of the Oslo agreements, Oslo 1, Oslo 2. Clinton got his photo up on the White House lawn. And uh, Paris and Rabin, they, they shook hands with Arafat. They legitimized this. Terrorists, all three of them, Paris, Rabin, and Arafat, got their Nobel Peace Prize. And this is leading, they hoped, towards a permanent solution. And in that atmosphere of peace, Rabin signed a peace deal with Jordan, 1994. Israel now adds a second Arab Muslim country, in addition to Egypt in the south, now Jordan. To the west, I'm sorry, to the east, They are now peace partners with Israel. The Oslo Accords seem to be changing and reshaping the map, but it was enormously controversial. Many in Israel believed that uh, this change of heart, it's not a real change of heart. And it's a big mistake to embolden and strengthen the PLO. I don't care if you call them the PA, it's still the same people and it's the same ideology. And there were incredible protests. And there was also a terrible event when the Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin, he was assassinated by an Israeli radical who wanted to thwart the continuation of the Oslo Accords, the continuation of the peace process. Rabin was assassinated in 1995. He was replaced by Peres, but very soon afterwards they had, they had an election and Netanyahu, he won a stunning victory over Shimon Peres. And although he pledged to continue the process and even agreed to withdraw from Hebron, the holy city, the various efforts to implement a a, a full solution, a complete solution, it really stalled under the three years of Netanyahu from 1996 to 1999. But then, in 1999, once again, the left in Israel gained power. The Labour Party was once again in control, and their leader was the more peace-oriented Ehud Barak. And he launched the most serious offer ever given for a Palestinian state. Since Oslo, the efforts to find a finalized solution, the the sticking points to to the negotiation was always around four or five major points. Territory. What are going to be the boundaries of the Jewish state versus the the Arab state? What are going to be the land swaps? How do we make sure that every state, so to speak, is contiguous? What about security? Israel is very desirous of maintaining security presence, both in the newly formed, would-be formed Palestinian state, but also along the Jordan Valley. They want to have a buffer between the Palestinian state on the east and on the west of the Jordan River. What about Jerusalem? Of course, the capital of Israel is Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the holiest city in the world. That's where temple, the Jewish temple was built by Solomon, first temple, second temple. This is where 
King David established this city as the capital of his empire. This has been the hope and the yearning of our people forever. Israel is not ready to relinquish Jerusalem. The Palestinians, well, they want also a capital in Jerusalem. And they're not willing to budge on their claims. That was a major sticking point in all these negotiations. And finally, the right of return. In 1948, when the state was founded, there were many Arabs that lived in the land that were conquered by Israel. And many of them, many of them fled. And there's a lot of debate. Did they flee? Did they leave on their own accord? Regardless, they lived there, and now they are refugees in various places. In the Gaza Strip, in Lebanon, in Jordan, in Syria. The Palestinians insisted on the right to return. Those refugees from the Nakba, from the founding of the state, from the independence of the state, the Arabs who fled Israel at the establishment of the state, the Palestinians wanted their right to return. They wanted to have to go back to their homeland, to their original homes. These were some of the sticking points. In the year 2000, Ehud Barak is the Israeli prime minister. President Clinton, who oversaw, who mediated the Oslo Accords at the beginning of his administration, first administration, he convenes what's known as the the Camp David Summit in the year 2000. Present is Clinton, the president, Ehud Barak, the prime minister of Israel, and Yasser Arafat, the president of the Palestinian Authority. They've had now some sort of arrangement for you know five, six, seven years. Can we have a permanent deal? And Barak offered Arafat basically the best deal he could ever get. You want the Pal- you want the Palestinian state? You want it in West Bank? In the West Bank? I'll give you ninety five percent of the West Bank. You have all of the Gaza Strip and ninety five percent of the West Bank, and the uh, the other land that had tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of Jewish set, settle, settlers, we'll keep that in Israel, we'll annex that to Israel, but we'll make up for you for that. We'll give you land swaps, and there'll be a safe passage connecting the Gaza Strip and the West Bank. The borders will be very robust. We're just going to keep 5% of the West Bank, just the big settlement blocks that have the big Jewish communities there. They'll become part of Israel. Everything else is part of the state of Palestine. What about Jerusalem? Again, Barak, Ehud Barak, Israeli Prime Minister, he said, we'll divide the city. The Arabs can have East Jerusalem. It will be their capital. What about the refugee question? Now there's, of course, hypocrisy here because you know, between 1948 and 1967, there were many, many Jews that were expelled from Arab countries, from Iraq, from Egypt, from all across North Africa. And there were more Jews that were expelled from Arab lands in the aftermath of Israeli statehood than Arabs were expelled from Israel. Now, many of these Jews who lived in those Arab countries, they were residents there before the advent of Islam. They'd been there for thousands of years. But they were expelled and they fled to Israel. And Israel worked really hard to absorb these new arrivals, to integrate them. By contrast, the Arabs who fled Israel by the Nakba, they remained permanently in in refugee camps. That the Arabs believed, would delegitimize Israel. And you're in the refugee camp and you're there for for decades until when you will eventually return with the right of return. No one was offering to compensate the Jews who were expelled from the Arab lands, but Barak made an amazing offer to address this right of return. Some of those refugees will be allowed back to their homes, into Israel. We'll make them citizens of Israel based upon humanitarian family reunification grounds. The rest of them will 
become citizens of the new Palestinian state. And those who were not grant, granted the return to their homes, there was a package of $30 billion that would be used as, compa- uh, as compensation for the refugees who did not return home. In the West Bank, Barak agreed to dismantle most of the Jewish settlements, to transfer the Jewish settlements to the areas, the 5% of the West Bank that was to be annexed by Israel. This was an incredible deal. And Barak, he, he was flailing at the polls. He really wanted a deal. And he made the offer. And Arafat walked away. No counter offer. Nothing. He just left. He was unwilling to give up on the right of return. He wanted four million Arabs to swarm Israel. Again, this is part of his plan. He didn't want a Jewish state. He wanted a single Palestinian state. And the plan is to allow the refugees to go back and then they'll turn Israel into a second Palestinian state. So Arafat balked and he left Camp David. Of course, no Israeli government would ever agree to allow all those people to return to their homes because it would completely destroy the demographics. It seems, it seems that the insistence on the right of return, that was like a poison pill. And that was intended to make an actual deal to make it an impossibility. Did Arafat want peace? It seems likely that he did not. Why not? Well, he already told us he wanted it all. He didn't want to actually have a final deal. Perhaps the Palestinian proclivity for violence was just insatiable. Perhaps he was worried about the billions, literally billions of dollars that he siphoned off from these funds, from the Palestinian funds to his own personal Swiss bank accounts. Regardless, he walked away. And instead of taking this incredible offer, he launched the second intifada, bus bombings, suicide bombings, hotel shoot-ups, restaurant bombings, the terrorists will terrorize. In 2004, Arafat died and was replaced by his lieutenant, Mahmoud Abbas, Abu Mazen. At the time, Israel was led by Ariel Sharon. He had been very hawkish, but he turned more dovish. And even though he was a force behind the Israeli settlements in Gaza, he orchestrated the disengagement, the unilateral pullout of Gaza in 2005. 9,000 Jews were uprooted from their homes. The shuls were, were bulldozed. The dead were exhumed from their graves. He made this unilateral move. There was nothing given back to Israel in return. And of course, given the events that happened in recent months, Everyone agrees that this was a terrible decision and a catastrophe. Sharon was sent into a coma by a series of strokes, and he remained in a vegetative state for almost a decade before he died, and he was replaced by a second Ehud. So we had Ehud Barak and now Ehud Olmert. And once again, he was eager to try to give the Arabs everything they wanted. The peace process was revived. And Olmert and Mahmoud Abbas, they almost reached an agreement. And again, the the deal was very similar to what Barak had offered Arafat. The Palestinians would get 99.5% of the land, the the equivalent land of the West Bank and Gaza. All of Gaza they'll get. Israel would annex 6% of the Palestinian territory, but they would compensate with land swaps, equivalent to 5.8% of percent of the, of the territory. They'll also have a corridor connecting Gaza and the West Bank. Jerusalem, again, would be a shared capital. They'll have the, the Palestinian capital on East Jerusalem, the Jewish capital on Western Jerusalem, a two-kilometer area that covered the old city of Jerusalem that will be under international administration. And Olmert even agreed to accept tens of thousands of refugees back to their homes. 
but he was not willing to go more than 40,000. Abbas wanted 150,000. Regardless, a deal was close, but it was not consummated. And Ehud Olmert told Mahmoud Abbas, he says, this offer I'm giving you right now, it's the best offer that any Israeli leader will give you for the next 50 years. He was desperate for a deal. At the time, he was in single-digit approval rates, and he was also indicted for corruption, which he was ultimately imprisoned for. Do you want the deal? Will you sign the deal? Abbas asked to see the map. He wanted to see the map, to show his, the map to his experts. They were meeting in Jerusalem. And Omar says, no, no, you can't take the map with you. You take the map with you, that's going to be the starting point of the next negotiation. Abbas, the Palestinians, walked away. And you know what? That was about 15 years ago. And so far, Olmert's prediction that if you don't accept it now, it's just going to get worse, it still stands true. In the year 2020, President Trump outlined his vision for peace, his so-called deal of the century. And this was a very comprehensive treatment of the granular subjects and the granular details of the two-state solution. It used the same basic framework. And at the time, still today, the Israeli Prime Minister is Netanyahu. And he famously, in his ninth, in, in his 2009 Bar Ilan speech, he, he gave conditional support to the establishment of a demilitarized Palestinian state alongside Israel. And therefore, he was okay with Trump's deal of the century. But the Palestinians, even before it was released, it was released in the form of a 181-page document going through all the details and very creative land swaps and all that, all the like. The Palestinians rejected it before it was even released. So where are we today? We could say that the, the two-state solution is dead. The two-state solution is dead, but long live the two-state solution. There's no partner. The sides are further away than they've been in a very long time. The peoples are increasingly less interested in pursuing a deal. But nevertheless, universally, Every country in the world is pushing this as the solution. The people don't want it. The politicians do want it. Both Ehuds, what they had offered, would not be acceptable by the majority of the Israeli population. And they did it nonetheless, which is, by the way, why these things are always negotiated in secret. They hope, okay, we'll have a deal in secret, then we could sell it to our to the public once it's already signed. But as of right now, there doesn't seem to be any grounds for any advancement in the two-state solution. Unless, of course, you're referring to the two-state solution that already exists, the 80% of the British mandate of Palestine that was allocated to an Arab state, the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. The two-state solution, it's really off the table for a very long time. What to do? What should Israel do in the absence of a plan going forward. So Netanyahu had, he had a plan. He had an approach. There were really two major prongs to his, to his approach. Number one is to keep the Palestinians divided. You prop up Hamas in Gaza and you keep the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank in, in, in place. And let them fight with each other. These two factions, if they're at each other's necks and they're not unified, they cannot move forward in the peace process because they're not, you know, they hate each other almost as much as they hate us, as they hate us. That will forestall the two-state solution indefinitely. Secondly, to ignore it and to circumvent it by making peace with the Arab, with, with the other Arab nations. That's the, the Abraham Accords. Israel signed a deal in the year 2020 with a variety of Arab states, the UAE, Bahrain, 
Morocco, amongst others, Sudan. Everyone tells us that we have to deal with the Palestinian issue first and then deal with the greater Arab world. No, we'll just go around it. We'll circumvent it. That was the plan. And it seemed like it was a good plan, of course, until the events of October 7th proved otherwise. To look beyond your immediate borders and to forget about the menace that is hell-bent on destroying you and slaughtering innocents, doesn't matter. Getting rid of Israel, wiping off the map, those people on your border, you cannot ignore them. So that approach, that's not a good approach. What can work? So maybe there are a variety of approaches that can work. You know, if you think about it, the Arabs, at least historically, have approached this dilemma from a religious perspective, from an Islamic perspective. Israel, basically, there's no one that does that. You know, the Muslims talk about, we want from the river to the sea, from the Jordan River until the Mediterranean Sea. That's what their religion tells them is theirs. What does our religion tell us is ours? We have verses in Scripture that tell us from the river to the river, from the Nile to the Euphrates. What does that mean? It's Egypt, it's Lebanon, it's Syria, it's Jordan. It's all ours. I don't know anyone on our side who's arguing that we follow our our religious guidelines of what lands belong to us. I don't know why, but that's just the fact. Why And why not? Even if you're unwilling to go that far, you don't want to claim territory that's granted to you by the Torah, at least with respect to the reality of a faction amongst you, people who live, your neighbors, who want you dead. They're a fifth column within the state and they're enemies at the very edge of the state. What would the Torah's guidelines be on this? Now, the people who propose this, they uh, many of them refuse to assign their name to it because it's it's very incendiary from a political and geopolitical perspective. But they argue that we we have the Torah's approach. Chapter 21 of Genesis, we read it every Rosh Hashanah. Abram has two sons. His son, Isaac, his primary son with his wife, Sarah. And then his other son, Ishmael, with his Egyptian maidservant, Hagar. And Ishmael is a threat to Isaac. He wants to kill him. He aims his arrows at, at Isaac. And Sarah tells Abraham, you have to banish Ishmael. Banish him and his mother. And Abraham doesn't want to do it. He's resistant. And God tells Abraham to hearken to his wife. So he does. He banishes his own son from his land, from the land of Canaan, and he sends Ishmael and Hagar to Egypt. Now, it's really interesting what happens next. In the following chapter, chapter 22 of Genesis, Ishmael makes a comeback. He's one of the lads who accompany Abraham and Isaac to the Binding of Isaac episode. When Abraham dies, he's buried in Hebron in Canaan. And who buries him? Ishmael and Isaac. So Ishmael was sent to Egypt, but he, he was welcomed back. What happened? In the ensuing times, Ishmael repented. And he accepted the authority and the dominion of Isaac. We, of course, know, and I don't think anyone contests this, Ishmael is the father of the Arabs. And the Torah tells us what happened when Ishmael was threatening Isaac. And, you know, Abraham resisted the suggestion because it's very painful to do this. His own son sent him away. But nevertheless, he goes ahead with it and he banishes Ishmael. But he allows Ishmael to come back. He's allowed back provided that he accepts the dominion of Isaac. If we were to, if Israel were to undertake this approach, call it the Ishmael solution. You can be here, but you have to demonstrate 
You have to completely make us comfortable with the fact that you're accepting our sovereignty and dominion. Is this a tenable solution? Is it a tenable solution to tell Ishmael's descendants, you must leave? You must go to Egypt, perhaps, until you're ready to live here under the rules? It might be too dicey diplomatically, not just diplomatically, in many other ways. So I don't know if this solution will actually ever be proposed, but there are many advocates of this solution. It's our land. We're not giving you an inch. You can live here, provided that you accept our authority. There is another solution. This one is championed by Dr. K. Dar. It's not the one-state solution. It's not the two-state solution. It's the 14-state solution. One Jewish state and 13 Arab states. His argument is that in the Middle East, the, the culture of the Arabs, it's just not compatible with Western-style nation-states. They, for a very long time, they flourish in a clan system, in a tribal system of families, the Hamulas, as it's known in Arabic. So he proposed an emirate system, where, like a city-state, is controlled by a family, by a tribe, by a clan, by a Hamula. This is the way that works in the Middle East. Thirteen states. In Gaza, you have state number one, Bet Lachia Bet Hanun, Gaza City, Dira Balach, Abbasan al Kabir, Khan Yunis, and Rafiach and Rafa in the south. Each one of them, it's its own little state. It's run by a, a clan, by a family, and it's an emirate. And in between all these cities, you have Israeli control or international oversight. To make sure that these families, these clans, do not establish any military power. Yes, you give them pistols. Yes, you give them the ability to self-govern. But you ensure that they cannot turn into a military power. No, no rifles, no longer guns. The same to do in the West Bank, Judea and Samaria. Seven different states. Emirates, Hebron, Hebron Jericho, Ramallah, Janine. Shem, Nablus, Tulkarim, and Kalkilia. Everything between these cities, all the villages between these big cities, you annex. And you keep them balkanized. Keep them separate. So that there can never arise a single unified state that would be like Hamas and that would cause a mortal threat to the state of Israel. That's the only way, argues Dr. Kedar to build a successful and enduring peace in a way that's modeled after you know, successful Arab states like the United Arab Emirates, seven different emirates. That's how they work. Not to occupy Arab population centers, just to oversee the land in between. And I will argue, I will, I will note that Professor Dershowitz in his case for Israel he actually says this is the correct approach that Israel should have taken after the Six-Day War. Don't occupy any of the population centers, just the land in between it. Is that a good idea? Will that be implemented? Hard to know, hard to say. But we know for sure is that the two-state solution, right now, it's moribund. And the Jews and the Palestinians, the Arabs, the Israelis, they have irreconcilable differences. And sometimes a divorce is called for. What exactly that looks like, that remains to be seen. There has been a long and tortured history of a two-state solution. And everyone thinks it's an easy way, it's a neat way to settle this conflict, the Arab-Israeli, the Arab-Palestinian conflict, once and for all. But I will remind you, until there's a genuine partner for peace, until a Palestinian leader actually says and believes that they will endorse and accept a Jewish state. Until someone has that reformation of Ishmael, where he changes and he actually changes, there won't be any solution. For a hundred years, there were attempts. Every single time, the Jews said yes, and the Arabs, to quote one of them, they said that Israel has no right to exist, even 
if the state of Israel was the size of a postage stamp. Until they accept Israel, until they accept Israel's right to exist, there will not be any viable solution. We hope that things are peaceful there regardless. And we hope, of course, and pray that the soldiers currently engaged in battle, they're successful and they come home safely. And the hostages, they come home safely and everyone who is injured is healed and everyone who is bereaving finds comfort. May we only hear good news from our brethren in the land of Israel and may the Almighty protect all of us. I thank you for listening. My email address is rabbiwalby at gmail.com. Thank you so much for listening to the podcast. Again, the website for the Torch fundraiser, for the annual Torch fundraiser, is happening right now. The website is givetorch.org. Every donation is doubled. Please visit givetorch.org. The link is in the description. Give a click on the link and give what you can give and support the great work of Torch in 2024. Again, the website is givetorch.org dot org.